إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وأزواجه وذريته كما صليت على آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وأزواجه وذريته كما باركت على آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد إن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم من نفخه ونفثه وهمزه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإن جنحوا للسلم فاجنح لها وتوكل على الله إنه هو السميع العليم وإن يريدوا أن يخدعوك فإن حسبك الله هو الذي أيدك بنصره وبالمؤمنين وألف بين قلوبهم لو أنفقت ما في الأرض جميعا ما ألفت بين قلوبهم ولكن الله ألف بينهم إنه عزيز حكيم صدق الله العلي العظيم ونفعني وإياكم بالذكر الحكيم Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Today I have a very important khutbah to deliver before you and the verses of the Qur'an that I've chosen are the foundation of this khutbah. Alhamdulillah, this is my tariqah, this is my method, this is my approach that I've learned from my great teachers. May Allah be pleased with them and be merciful to them. They have passed away, most of them. And those who are alive, may Allah reward them for this khair that they have taught me, the ulama. The Qur'an, my brothers and sisters, it's for all times, all places, and all people. Therefore, whenever something happens, you must go back to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the last week's khutbah that I gave to you, even though I was talking about Ahlul Bayt, but remember a hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa that I shared with you, where he said, I am leaving with you thaqalain, two heavy things. Kitabullah, don't forget Kitabullah. This hadith, by the way, is in our six authentic collections. Very big. Hadith of Saqalain. It's called Hadith of Saqalain. Don't forget the Kitabullah. Prophet ﷺ actually, in that khutbah that he gave, this was one of his last speeches, one of his farewell talks in the last three months of his life in dunya, before his wisal, before his wafat. So he says, do tamasuk with it. You know, he gave raghbah of the kitab and so much reminder, so much reminder about the kitab. Why? Because Allah tells you in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ ضَرَبْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلٍ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ This ayah has been repeated many, many, many times in the Quran. I just shared with you one of them. قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا غَيْرَ ذِي عِوَجِلْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ for your taqwa, for your piety, if you seek guidance, this Qur'an, you shall find every life scenario a guidance. Here is one that I have chosen for you. Uh, listen to the translation. Some of you already know what I have recited, but it's important to translate it. Surah Al-Anfal, Ayah 61, 62, and 63. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And if they incline to peace, then you also inclined to it. Allah is telling to the believers, Prophet ﷺ and the believers and all Muslims of course. If they, they, non-believers of course, incline to peace, offer you peace, then you too incline to it and put your trust in Allah subhanahu ta'ala. That's very important to remember. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu ta'ala. Verily, He is all-hearer, the all-knower. 
Remember every word, my brothers and sisters, that I'm translating before you. Even if you can connect them with the Arabic, the Quran actually, not the spoken Arabic. Why? Next ayah, listen to this. Allah says, and if they intend, if they plan, if they plot to deceive you, then indeed Allah is enough for you. It is He, Allah, who has helped you with His help, who has supported you with His Nusra, with His support, with His help, and the believers that are going to be on this path with you. 63, and these believers then, Allah tells you, who are those believers who will be on this path together? Allah has decreed a love in their hearts for one another. And He says, and if had you spent the entire world's assets, wealth, everything that's there, ma jami'a, whatever is in this earth, you, you could not, meaning you, Muhammad Sallallahu you could not have brought that love in their hearts. It's Allah who has put love, love in their hearts. He is mighty and wise. Sami'ul Alim, Nasir, Azizun Hakim. Five names of Allah directly or indirectly are mentioned in these three ayat, my brothers and sisters. May Allah give you and I a true understanding of the Book of Allah. Now, when you look at this ayah, my brothers and sisters, one third of the Quran is actually stories of the people of the past. Stories events. And then subhanAllah, a huge portion of the Quran is also about the incidents. They came, these ayat of the Quran came due to some incidents, events, occurrences. So you can imagine how important it is to not just know what Quran says do and don't, do and don't, also to understand the events, the stories, the occurrences and sometimes the events behind these ayat. Look, this ayah will not make any sense to you if there was no practical to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a practical. And sometimes those practicals you will find in the seerah of Rasulullah or the companions of Prophet Muhammad for that matter or all the salihin around Rasulullah whether it's household or the family. So it is very important to pay attention to these. Some people just brush it off and say, Til qad khalat laha ma kasabat. Ah, oh, brother, don't talk about it. This is the stories of the people in the past. Laha ma kasabat, wa lakum ma kasabtum, wa la tusaluna amma kanu ya'malun. You shall not be asked about it uh, in your grave. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. This is dhulm with the Qur'an. They quote an ayah of the Qur'an that has nothing to do with the qisas of the Qur'an. Would Allah tell you one-third of the Qur'an? Imagine one-third out of 550 pages, you have more than 200 or 100 plus pages are all stories. And then so many ayat of the Quran that are associated with the stories that were happening at the time Quran was coming down. You want to delete all of that? This means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why was He telling us all this? Watch out what the people will tell you. This is a narrative. Watch the word narrative. This is a narrative that is built by the corrupt and passed on to the Muslims so that Muslims stay in darkness or ignorance and they don't know what direction to take in the future. Because my brothers and sisters, these stories and events are so important that Allah SWT says there is ibra in them. Faqsus al-qasas, tell them the story. Inna fi dhalika la ayat li kulli sabbarin shakoor wa dhakkirhum bi ayyam Allah. Inna fi dhalika la ayat li kulli sabbarin shakoor. These are several ayat. If I keep telling you, the list will go on and on. Allah tells you, tell them the story. Tell them the qissa. Tell them this. Remind them with this. There is ibra in this. There is lesson in this. And I, you know, to make it all simple in one statement, I was discussing, uh, we ha I had a class with a professor here at Western uh, in education. He's a philosopher of education. One of the very old Professors, subhanAllah, and he's a philosopher. And you know how philosophers are sometimes, you know, the good philosophers. They will leave you with something that one line can be de decoded or dissect, um, you know, or, or unpacked into like chapters and books. We had a discussion about education system in America. I was taking a class in spring uh, for my doctorate, alhamdulillah. May Allah make it easy. 
<laughs> <Make dua. laughs> so I said, uh, Professor, this is, uh, well, we, we studied a lot of history today. We were talking about the history of education in America. I said, that's a lot of history. He said, Hafiz, remember, all history is present. That's all he said. All history is present. I said, wow, you nailed it. <laughs> you nailed it. This is the reality. So now, you see, history would always repeat itself. There is another saying in this country. History repeats itself. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be wary of these things. Whether it's sweet history or sour history, it will repeat itself. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be familiar with these things. Because if we must learn, inshallah, and we understand, then we can plan our future. Keep our experiences, our lessons in mind, and then you decide your future direction. This, these ayat came at a time when Muslims, now I'm going to take you to the story. That's a sweet one, not the sour one. Sweet story, alhamdulillah, happy story. Muslims were stopped from making Umrah, Hudaybiyah, at a place called Hudaybiyah, just in the outskirts of Mecca. This never happened in the history of Arabia that even if an enemy is coming, the Quraysh, who were mushrikeen, pagans, kuffar at that time, they had this Ibrahimi tradition from the times of Ibrahim and Ismail, peace be upon them, that they would never stop anybody from making Umrah and Hajj, even if it's their sworn enemy. Now Muslims were being invaded, Badr, Uhud, Ahzab, one after other, and then other skirmishes and skirmishes and skirmishes, attacks. Here comes Muslims telling Rasulullah, Rasulullah, we want to go make Umrah. They thought this is a custom of uh, Jahiliyyah, that even Jahiliyyah people, even the ignorant people who were not in Islam anymore, but because they were progenies of prophets of Allah. Ibrahim and Ismail, peace be upon them. They were children of Ismail and Hajar, peace be upon them all. They would have kept it. But there you go, Muslims are held. And they're told that you cannot come for Umrah. And now, Prophet ﷺ took an oath of allegiance from the companions. This is a very special time. And all those companions of Rasulullah who gave him the oath are promised Jannah, my brothers and sisters. They're promised Jannah. It was an oath to fight till death. That this is our right to worship. How could they stop us? Now Meccans rushed. They said, oh, let's have, uh, we are offering you, let's have a talk, let's have a peace talk. Remember the Meccans, you've heard, mashallah, this group has heard a lot of seerah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah bless the brother who gave these khutbahs. How much torture, aggression, tyranny was committed on Muslims. They left for their lives. Some fled to Habasha, Ethiopia. Some fled to, most of them fled to Medina. Look, and then they were invaded. One again and again and again, and here they are, and Kuffar are telling them, let's talk peace. This is one time when Muslims had the upper hand. Umar comes to Rasulullah, Rasulullah, we are on haq, don't, don't take this call for peace, do, please don't do this, you know, and he is actually going aggressive, and Abu Bakr is telling him, Umar, stop, stop, calm down, you can't do that, you can't do that, you're crossing the line, and Umar was like, man, we have the upper hand, we're gonna fight, this is our time to take our revenge. Allah commands Rasulullah, Rasulullah is the walking Quran, Quran is saying, they offer you peace, take the call for peace. How could Rasulullah listen to his counsel? No, Allah is the above everything. He is above everything. So you can't just take people's counsel. When Allah's counsel is there, to take the peace. So if Rasulullah this time does not take call for the peace, there will be a wrong message about Islam. Why? So Prophet ﷺ took the call for peace. Long story short, there was a peace agreement signed. Ten years of peace. A lot of good things. Some things seemed very rough to Muslims, like, wow, we have the upper hand and we're being told that if someone converts and comes to Medina, you return him back. And if your guy leaves Islam and comes to Mecca, we're not going to return him back. What kind of peace deal is this? We, we are squashed again. Prophet says, no, Allah has revealed the Quran. This is Fathum Mubeen. This is open victory. This is open victory. This is not a defeat. Now, I'm going to tell you how this was 
an open victory from some other philosophical angles that if you just pay close attention, you will know. You see, the world was witnessing at that time that Muslims are just in fight. Whether defensive or not defensive, they are in skirmishes and wars and battles or whatever. This is one time the world will get the message that Muslims were on the right. They were stopped unjustifiably. They were on the haq. They were stopped unjustifiably. And number three, Islam actually offers peace to the world. That's why they took it, even if they had the upper hand. Three. Number four, Muslims were allowed to preach freely. That was a big thing. And number five, not only preach freely, wherever Muslims are in Arabia, they are also allowed to practice Islam freely. It's a victory. It's a win-win situation. Allahu Akbar. Now, my brothers and sisters, remember this and now come to the situation of Afghanistan. It's all over the news. In the last three weeks, President of America, President Biden has given two or three speeches. There's been press conferences. There's been hearings in the House. There's been congressional reports released. There's a lot of public information about it. Well, Afghanistan, this country, the situation to understand this country, this region actually, you have to know its history. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a quick synopsis a, or sort of a summary so that you understand that this peace that I talked about, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi there is something similar to that happened in Afghanistan also. If we can apply that. Remember I told you, Quran is for all times. Now, now this region actually, specifically Central Asia and Afghanistan, and then parts of where I came from. This region I have very close ties with because I grew up in a city that was actually ruled by Afghans. That was ruled by Afghans, Pashtun people. And Afghans are one of the earliest recipients of Islam. They received Islam in the times of Umar ibn Khattab when Muslims took the entire Persian Empire. When Allah opened Persia, Persia for Muslims, this region was connected with the Persian Empire. These are Farsi-speaking people. So actually, my parents and a lot of people from Pakistan, India region spoke Farsi and wrote Farsi and understood Farsi. It was the official language of the region. Even before the times of the Mughals. So I have very close ties and then I am a madrasa, <laughs> madrasa graduate. The word madrasa became such a buzzword after 9-11. And you know, we're coming again sadly to the anniversary of 9-11. When I went to the United States Embassy before uh, officially serving as an imam, the counselor asked me that, have you been to a madrasa? On my face, I said, yes. <laughs> I didn't lie. Actually, I just saw one of my uncles. He reminded me something. He said, look, your case is like an open book. Be straightforward. I had a half an hour talk with him and a couple of my other uncles here. And they told me, just be truthful. You see, that's the beauty about America and Americans. You speak the truth, it, it does make a difference. So I said, yes, I did go to madrasas. A madrasa, not many madrasas, officially. They said, did you get any military training? I said, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> of course not. You have any experience with explosives or anything? I said, no, no, none of this. I am a man of book. I want to, I might, I partied mostly my party. I don't want to use the word party. I celebrated holy book. That's what I studied in Madrasa's world. So, wallahi, when I entered the interview, there were people who, just like how they make fun of Afghan people, especially Taliban. Oh, these bearded people. Oh, these mullahs. Look at them. They will run this uh, modern world. They know how to run the modern affairs. Wallahi, I was laughed at. Just because I had a beard by Muslims. I was in the embassy and people were saying, oh, look at this bearded guy. He's here to get an American visa while there is hot clashes going on between Taliban and some Madrasa people and Pakistan government and America and Afghan uh, government at that time. So it was a very hot and tense situation. A lot of people actually here told me, do not go. You will not be allowed to come back. 
I took my chances and I went in. Alhamdulillah, face to face. And wallahi, that kafira, that non-believer was nicer to me than some of the Muslims who made fun of me. It makes me want to cry, wallahi, the way they treated me. People were making jokes on me. Just the way I look like. That, that, isn't that shameful how Muslims think? This is هَذَا تُحْفَةُ الْتُحْفَةُ secularism. They think secularism is the way. This is the reality of secularism. Hypocrisy. They want the world to turn to their ways. They want to force people. They are radicals. They are as bad as the extremists who kill innocent people. Just the strategy is different. So I told them. I said, no, I did not do this. I am a, I, so alhamdulillah, I have a connection. So the madrasas I went to, I met a lot of Pashtun people. I met a lot of Afghans. A lot of Afghani people. In the times of uh, war with the Russia, early 90s, I was a kid. So I remember a lot of the stories. So subhanAllah, Islam came there very early. These people love Islam. If you remember, Imam Bukhari is also from the same region, Central Asia, all the way to Afghanistan. So imagine how early Islam reached there that the impact was that Imam Bukhari now is your most celebrated, most authentic muhaddith of Islam. Within one and a half century of Islam. Sadly, when Khilafa Rashida fell down, Rashida, the guided caliphate of 30 years, after that, we had Umayyads and Abbasis. They tried to control this area, but of course, when you don't have the justice like the righteous caliphs that Prophet ﷺ promised us, nobody will be ruled with injustice. These regions declared themselves a separate kingdom, a Khwarizmi dynasty, all the way till Mongol invasions. So Mongols are actually one of the first non-believing invaders since Islam reached these lands. They sacked this dynasty, <coughs> killed a lot of Muslims. And I want to tell you one city of Afghanistan it's called Bamiyan, where grandson of uh, Chinggis Khan, son of Chagata Khan or Chagatai Khan, some people call it, not Chugtai, Chagatai Khan. His son Muto Khan died because people in the forts inside they shot an arrow and hit him. So Chinggis Khan was leading this battle, the you know the famous uh, Mongolian uh, general, the warrior. He said, "When this city falls." I'm going to teach them a lesson. I'm going to punish them for the death of my grandson. So he literally ordered complete annihilation of this city, Bamiyan. To the extent that some of the historians said, and I've read this history, alhamdulillah, when I was a kid, at that time I knew this. Even the animals, he said, livestock, cattle, kill everything. So this is Afghanistan. And at that time, when complete annihilation took place, Afghans did not sit down and did not get afraid of this. They fought back and they took their region back. So much so that some of the Mongolian invaders became Muslims. And their children were ruling now the same lands, like Temuri dynasty, Temur Lang. Temur who became one of the very powerful kings of this region. I'm going to just bring you to last 200 years what has happened. A king called Nadir Shah, who ruled the Persian territories, modern day Iran, Afghanistan, big parts of Central Asia, was heavily in control. But then when he passed away, the region fell into oblivion again, internal civil strife. And that, subhanAllah, remember, internal civil strife. Keep that in mind. This happened recently again, 20 years, uh, 30 years back. Then, subhanAllah, look how much influence Islam had and the ulama. These people, they were so much under the influence of scholars and Islam, religious scholars, that scholars in India would send a letter that teach a lesson to such and such corrupt Mughal king, come and invade. And one of the successors was chosen by a sheikh. Uh, they were having this uh, shura, like in Rasulullah's time, their jirga. They were having shura, council. A lot of people were discussing who should lead us. We have a situation that whole region is into, you know, 
small mini kingdoms and warlords and all that. Sheikh, one alim, scholar, imam goes and takes one guy and puts the crown on his head and he says, Ahmad Shah Abdali is going to be your king. This Ahmad Shah was, he loved the ulama so much that in Delhi, he invaded Delhi once. Shah Waliullah, a great muhaddith, scholar of hadith of Delhi, found out that Ahmad Shah is brutally, brutally killing people. Shah Waliullah goes and literally in the midst of battle, he reaches Ahmad Shah and he holds his hand and slaps him on his face. Imagine a scholar doing that to a ruler. Today, a scholar, if he doesn't make dua for the king, he's never to be seen. <laughs> Ahmad Shah stopped. He says, go back where you came from. I don't want you to do any bloodshed here. So this is who Afghan people are. Now, for Western domination, Western influence started when one of the successors of this king, is Dost Muhammad, was in charge in 1826. British noticed that he's making some kind of alliances with the Russians. Russians needed access to the ports that British were also using, so they sent a spy the name of Alexander Burns, and they tried to actually manipulate things. The British said, oh, we're not influencing your area, blah, blah, blah. We're just here to make friendships so that you don't make friendships with the Russians. Eventually, they actually sacked his government and forced him to exile. And subhanAllah, Dost Muhammad, who was the king, Ahmad Shah and Dost Muhammad, these people were one of the strongest kings who actually ruled. Ahmad Shah, all the way till late 1700s, ruled all the way to Mashhad of Iran and parts of northern India, and then subhanAllah, even Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, these areas. So these people had loyalties amongst them. So subhanAllah, he was sacked by the British. Now British, USSR, and United States. This is where we come to now. First one was the British. Listen to what British did. They sacked him, and he surprisingly did not fight. His people did not fight, they retreated. They said, wow, it's an easy victory. Well, they started a guerrilla war. And how this war turned into a worst military defeat of Great Britain ever is that Mr. Alexander Burns and uh, Lord McN uh, was, um, William, William McNaughton, these people were fraternizing with, the, with women in Kabul. They even had some women invited into the palace and they were doing things with them which angered the locals. Locals, many of them who were allies with them, because Burns was, Alexander Burns was hired to actually buy out loyalties and bribe people. They assassinated him. While already there was a guerrilla war all over Afghanistan region. And finally, the, one of the sons of Dost Muhammad and Dost Muhammad, they returned to power, just like before. Just watch this. this is, this, history is repeating itself. And then they said, okay, we want a promise from you that you will give us a safe way back to India. They did that, but the tribes of modern-day Peshawar in this area took on more than 20,000 British troops. And they left only one alive and sent him back to in, uh, Delhi, sent them a message that don't ever try to invade our lands. There were further invasions, but they were never able to occupy Afghanistan like they attempted in this time. Then, my brothers and sisters, USSR time comes again. They had their eyes on this region from 1800s. They come again, they invade, and that's when America also puts themselves in this war. Your tax dollars, millions and millions, were already poured in. It's not just this $2 trillion of the last 20 years. SubhanAllah, this is when... USSR also faced a very humiliating defeat. And they left a lot of weaponry. And these weapons, one Russian officer, a big general said that you will see what the weapons we're leaving will do to Afghanistan. And rightly so, this is where one of the deadliest civil wars of Muslim history ever started in Afghanistan. One after other, this group killing group, this group, this one, this group killing this one. So much bloodshed of Muslims were being shed. Warlords and warlords and warlords in every small district and locality. Where did this group Taliban come from? 
So what happened that there was an area where the, a warlord who was a pedophile. Now this story is narrated by a secular journalist who actually does not like Taliban. He reports this story. So believe its authenticity. It's not a bearded Muslim reporting this story. This is authentic. We knew this. Long time we knew this. A warlord was into pedophilia. They kidnapped a child and they wanted to actually celebrate this child's intaking with this warlord. Locals were very angry, just like how they were with British. See, these people loved Islam. So they went to a sheikh, a local sheikh. With only a group of 15 people, the local sheikh not only retrieved that child, but also got rid of the warlord and declared an Islamic emirate, Islamic country of Afghanistan from one city. This guy's name was Mullah Muhammad Umar. And his students that were with him from the same madrasa or madrasa, I, as the Westerners call it, madrasa, less than 20 students established an authority in a small city. Then it expanded to the province. They were hailed by the people. Now, however, around the mid 90s, they were able to contain or occupy most of Afghanistan. That Taliban literally means the students, the students of madrasas. Many of them were veterans of Russian war. They fought against Russia. Last 50 years, they've seen nothing but war. These people, my brothers and sisters, finally, when they reached Kabul, in Kabul, they saw a life. Remember, Kabul was always the center of all these foreign invasions and everything. They saw a life that they couldn't even fathom. Remember, USSR had invaded the same place and was based in Kabul. There were nightclubs, there were this, there were that. So they started taking very extreme measures. If someone doesn't have a beard, as of course, as the media told us, they would tell them, you must grow a beard. If somebody's not praying, they would hit them with sticks. Um, there were cinemas that were burned down. A lot of these things they did that gave them a bad publicity, of course. And when the 9-11 happens, at the time of 9-11, remember, anywhere there's a Muslim who has a beard, who looks practicing Muslim, was the target of our media. Thank God media is not targeting Muslims that way anymore. There is some, alhamdulillah, change. But at the time of 9-11, it was very bad for Muslims. If you are an Afghani or even associated, you look like Arab, you look Afghani, you look Muslim with beards or turbans, you're in trouble. A lot of people were actually killed in America. That's when Western media was showing images that were very graphic, very violent, that did not even make any sense. Now, in these first three months of 9-11, sadly, we have the, the anniversary coming again. They asked for Osama bin Laden from this group, from Taliban. They'd give us Osama bin Laden. You have two or three weeks. Now, there were people from some of the neighboring Muslim countries, such as Pakistan, military officers, who actually, in the times of Afghan war, had trained these people to fight Russians. So they had an influence upon these people. They went and negotiated with Mullah Muhammad Umar, who was their Amirul Mu'mineen, the Khalifa. Said, please give this guy back. Otherwise, everybody's going to be bombed here. He says, on what basis I should give him back? Just because America thinks he did 9-11? So after negotiations, this is quoted in the book also that is written by the president, ex-president of Pakistan, who was part of these negotiations, Musharraf. He said, we offered them, well, actually one of his generals, he quoted that. He actually spoke in Pashto what Mullah Umar said. Mullah Umar said, look, I am ready to give him any time, but you have to first find him guilty. So the resolution was the proposal that everybody agreed upon that we will deliver him if there is a court set and has six Muslim countries judges and one from Afghanistan, seven judges, Muslim judges will sit in a jury or a panel. And if he is found guilty, we will deliver him. President Bush was adamant that, no, I want him no matter what. Give him to us or there is war. He says, then this is against our principles. Prophet ﷺ told us, do not deliver a Muslim in the hands of a kafir unjustifiably. 
He says, this is unjustified. This is unjust. We have to find him guilty first. You cannot be, he told President Bush that you cannot be the jury and the judge and the court and everything. That's not fair. And the proposal, when he reached him, he says, tell me this proposal, can you use this in any court of law in America? And all the negotiators who were from the American side were silent. World's largest alliance was formed to carpet bomb Afghanistan, brothers and sisters. These people, once again, they fled. Like those Muhammad's time, they left. A lot of people thought they are done. They have lost. Well, there was a rise. This was their fall. And the man, the leader who disappeared, he said, President Bush has promised us humiliation and defeat, and Allah has promised us his victory and his support. And we will see. Time will tell who is true, and time will also tell who are our true brothers and who are hypocrites. He called, sadly, the country I came from, the leadership as being hypocrites. Because Pakistani leadership, I have to be fair and honest here, offered their airports, their air bases, everything to bomb our brothers and sisters ruthlessly, which people protested against. The current prime minister of Pakistan was one of the few people who, were, who was on the road. He was saying, don't do this. You cannot win a war like this. You are going to create more enemies. You're going to create more problems. You will never get out of this. Mark my words. Nobody listened to him. Instead, they called him, you are Taliban Khan. And now you see, I listened to our president's speech more than once, very carefully. He himself admitted, and Forbes and many authorities said, we spent in 20 years 200 million, 300 million every day. 300 million every day. And you can clearly see he's regretting that. Congress hearings are clearly showing we are regretting that. Americans are regretting that. It's a hard-earned money that you paid, your hard work money, tax dollars, all gone into waste. Well, it has two angles. One is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran. Again, I will take you back to Quran, Surah Anfal, Ayah 36. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ لِيَصُدُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَسَيُنْفِقُونَهَا ثُمَّ تَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسْرَةً ثُمَّ يُغْلَبُونَ وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ يُحْشَرُونَ Allah is saying that. That the disbelievers, they will spend money to, against the path of Allah. And then they spend it and spend it until it becomes a regret for them. And they are overpowered also. Not only they spend, but they are overpowered. And these kuffar will be sent to hellfire. Allah is saying that. However, there is a beacon of hope. This could have lasted another decade or two. We don't, we don't know. Some people wanted that status quo. Keep spending, keep spending. Some people maybe wanted America to drown and completely be destroyed in this war. But mashallah, something good this administration did. Like the eye of the Quran we started the khutbah with. They offered Taliban that you control 50-60% of Afghanistan. Let's sit down and talk. Let's have a peace talk. And Alhamdulillah, some of my seniors are witnesses of this. I was at a church way before this peace agreement happened. I told them, if you want to come out of this safely, you have to do a peace deal with them. Otherwise, it will be a further and further mess, which some people actually maybe want that against America. They're not well-wishers of America. Alhamdulillah, I had a deep feeling that this, inshallah, will go successful. And this happened during the peace deal. There was a peace agreement. I don't understand why none of the mass media today will tell you about this peace agreement. In this peace agreement, there was guarantees from Taliban that we will never allow your soil to be used. Uh, I mean, our soil to be, Afghani soil to be used against America or its allies. We will not allow any ISIS or Al-Qaeda extremist groups. Alhamdulillah, this was part of the agreement. And they said, 
the government part, this was part of the agreement that we do not honor this government. You install this government like British used to do, like USSR used to do. If we accept them the legitimate government, they offered us positions and power long time ago. We could have taken positions and had fun with them. They're corrupt people, leave them to us. This was part of the Doha Qatar agreement. This Munafiq media, hypocrite media does not mention that. I'm surprised, it's mind boggling. And we will also keep our name as it was before you invaded Afghanistan. Islamic Imarat is Imarat al-Islami Afghanistan. Just like you have, unite, you have United Arab Imarat, it's not a new name. All they're saying is we will have Islam with it. Imarat al-Islami Afghanistan. This was all part of the agreement. Alhamdulillah. So remember, had Taliban not taken the peace call, they would be seen as aggressors. Islam would be seen as a violent religion. Alhamdulillah, by them taking the peace call, by them sitting for dialogue, by them agreeing that we will not allow our soil to be used against America. Mashallah, I like that. Thank you. I don't care what was told about them 20 years ago. All I care is now the facts are that they've made these agreements. Alhamdulillah, if they honor, we will support them. If they don't honor their agreement, we will be against them. Even as Muslims, we have to. But let's see. If they have made the agreement, will they honor or not? And I want to end the khutbah here on this ayah of the Quran. This is a sunnah of Allah from the times of Talut and Jalut. Surah Baqarah, again Quran will tell you. Ayah 249, when they saw the army of Goliath and they said, La qaqata lana al-yawma bijaluta bujunudi. Believers, only believers, 313 believers. Prophet told us, there were 313 only. They said, this is a huge army. Talut, we cannot, we cannot fight these people. But those with Talut, among them was Dawood al-Islam also, David. David and Goliath, Christians and Jews all believe in this. He says, Alladina, Allah says, those who believe in meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said, Kam min fi'atin, qalilatin ghalabat fi'atan kathiratan bi'idhnillah, wallahu ma'as sabirin. How many a times Allah has given victory to a smaller group over a vast majority, a bigger group, a power, with the help of Allah. And Allah is with those who are patient on this path. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد Remember my brothers and sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran about the non-believers making plans against Muslims Allah says وَقَدْ مَكَرُوا مَكْرَهُمْ وَعِنْدَ اللَّهِ مَكْرُهُمْ وَإِنْ كَانَ مَكْرُهُمْ لِتَزُولَ مِنْهُ الْجِبَالِ Allah says their plots are very dangerous, but leave their plots to Allah. Even though their plots are so deadly that it could shake or destroy, move on upside down the mountains. I actually sadly saw a hint of that plotting during the talks of our administration, including our president's talk. And I'm exercising the right of my free speech. President in his speech twice mentioned a civil war in Afghanistan, like it happened after Russia left. Twice he mentioned that we prepared Afghan military for that civil war. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. You just want bloodshed there, even after you're leaving? Remember what Allah said in the Quran? If they plan to deceive or they have bad plans, leave it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is sufficient for you. And this is what has happened. Allah, by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, civil war has not happened yet, alhamdulillah. And I hope it does not happen. I don't want to see another civil war, my brothers and sisters. Look at Syria, look at Libya, look at Yemen. I don't want to see that. We wish peace, not just for America, but for the whole world. That's where, as a Muslim and as a human being, this is my human dignity that I must wish peace, not civil war. Two days ago, our president said, civil war, civil war, twice. What are you talking, sir? Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not let this happen yet. May Allah did not let it happen. Alhamdulillah. And you see this chaos at the airports. My, you can disagree with this, of course. 
Today, this is again my analysis, my philosophy behind this, or my observation. You announced in any country, any third world country, that you will be given free visas to America. Be it Mexico or Venezuela or Cuba, the most anti-America countries, people will flood the airports and all that. People will flood. This is an opportunity. A lot of people are poor. They want to just have a good life. This is the Zahir. Remember, we're living in the times of fitness. Look from the other angle of these fitness. This also, this chaos that was created, gave a cover to all those spies like Mr. Burns, Alexander Burns in the times of Britain and many others in the times of USSR. It gave a cover to the spies and the informants who were amongst these Afghans. It was a very good cover fire without actual fighting. And sadly, they're showing videos in the media, which is very disturbing, that uh, outside of the airport, these Afghan, now current power, is shooting in the air to disperse the people who are flooding toward the airports, right? You've seen that. How many of you have seen that? Raise your hand. You must have seen it, right? Look, they're not telling you that our U.S. Marines were shooting directly onto people and several people were killed, which is a bigger violation of the human rights. They're talking about, oh, girls are not going to go to school. This is going to happen. That can happen. Come on, give me a break. 5,000 troops on the airport and you, you made a mess even worse. And you are telling us there's going to be attack and attack and attack and attack happens. And hundreds of people died. None of these people were killed by this so-called backward Muslim government. That is not accepted yet as a government. I think we should give peace a chance. If they have promised peace, we also made a commitment in Doha, in Qatar. Let's honor from both sides. Whoever will behave treacherously, Allah will deal with them. Both sides. When, if a Muslim does not honor his agreement, or a non-Muslim does not honor the agreement. Allah is watching. That's, remember the ayah of the Quran we started. And I want to leave you with a long hadith. Uh, due to the time, inshallah, sometime I will give you um, a full uh, khutbah on this particular hadith. But Prophet ﷺ told us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is 42.52. You have a reference on your prayer schedule. Go look in your prayer schedule, 42.52. You see, before I tell you quickly this hadith, Afghan people are the only people whose culture and deen did not change throughout these invasions. I have met several of my brothers, my dear brothers and sisters from Central Asia. Their language, their culture, even the Quran, everything was taken away from them. They can't even write language in their own script. And drinking alcohol and all of that has been introduced. So much so that we had a brother, he left back, alhamdulillah, to Kazakhstan. He became a better Muslim here. And then he went back to Kazakhstan. When he was getting married, he said, brother, in my marriage, there's going to be open service of alcohol. And my elders are telling me, you are the <laughs> children of Genghis Khan. You're Mongols. This is your heritage. I said, astaghfirullah, tell them Islam is before Mongols. Mongols came in the 11th and 12th, 12th 13th century. But this region has shown that resilience, they have steadfast on their Islam. They, that's why a lot of people are cooperating. Brother, 60, 70,000 people, you can never walk over like this and declare amnesty like Prophet ﷺ did in Mecca. In thousand years after Salahuddin Ayyubi, this is the only time when people have taken a place without war and saying open amnesty to anybody who does not fight us. La ilaha illallah. Because Rasulullah ﷺ told us, 42.52 of Sunan Abi Dawood. Look it up. It's a beautiful hadith. I'm going to give you just the end. Prophet ﷺ told us, وَلَا تَزَالُ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْ أُمَّتِي عَلَى الْحَقِّ ظَاهِرِينَ لَا يَضُرُّهُمْ مَنْ خَالَفَهُمْ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ I want to close on this. Prophet ﷺ told us that in my ummah, there will not, this, there will always be a group. They will never cease. They will never give up who will stand for truth and they will resist. Nobody can harm them. Nobody can wipe them out. They will always be there. Always help of Allah will come. There is so many turq of this hadith where once Rasulullah said, until Dajjal shows up, 
until the Dajjal shows up, these people will be helped by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody can defeat them. Nobody can wipe them out. Why? Because these people are standing on their deen. Allah has promised us in the Quran, وَكَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْنَا نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ if you are a true believer, brothers and sisters, living in America, hustle and bustle of this country, the bling bling of this country, the, you know, the, the hip hop culture and all of that, don't be swayed with that. If you stand firm on your Islam, if you are on the truth, no matter what happens, no matter how many loved ones will die or suffer and all that, at the end, victory is yours. Allah's help will come. Allahumma ja'alna min haula. May Allah make you and I among Taifatul Mansura. This is called Taifatul Mansura of Islam. There will always be one. Prophet promised us and we believe in the Prophet's promise. And Rasulullah not only promised us, but actually Quran also told us that these people are called Ansarullah. Allahumma ja'alna min Ansarik. Allahumma ja'alna min Ansarullah. Oh Allah, make you, may, we pray that may we all be among the supporters of Allah's cause. May we live and die on this. May we be among this Taifatul Mansura. May we be among the believers. May we be among the people of Taqwa. And we ask Allah to protect us from all the evils, all the evils that are in His creation. Na'udhu bi kalimatillahi tamma min kulli shaytanin wa hamma wa min kulli aynin lamma. Allahumma inna na'udhu bi kalimatillahi tamma bi kalimatika at tamma min sharri ma khalaq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from the evil of the creation and the evil of the jinn. All the evil that is around us, we ask to be protected. We ask Allah to give us peace and give our lands peace. Give Nusra to the believers. Allahumma ansur al-Islam wa al-Muslimin. Allahumma a'izz al-Islam wa al-Muslimin. Allahumma adhill al-shirk wa al-mushrikeen. Allahumma dammir kulla a'da al-deen. Qala Allah ta'ala fi al-Quran al-Kareem. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم وأقم الصلاة